Hi everybody, welcome to Criminology. Now, bear in mind, this is going to be like a, what we call a survey course. And so that just really means we're going to do a, a, an overview of the whole topic of criminology. So we're going to look at the beginning of the beginning here. We're going to do crime and criminology, which is chapter one. So we're going to go through just an introductory component around the importance of what definitions and concepts to get the ball rolling. And then we'll move into some of the theories and then look at some of the crime demographics and statistics. So let's get started with crime and criminology. And we're going to do this in two parts. Many of the videos we do will be two a week, dividing a chapter in half and carrying on, okay? Now there will be the odd one that will be a single video. This one will be two. So let's think about this. Beginning in 2020, people's lives in the world over began changing. Academically, sociologically, and criminologically, thinking was being ramped up. Now living during a global pandemic, that forced many people to reflect on their lives the social norms that we had once understood, or the routines, and the interaction with other people. And then to make this rapid, often forced change to our behaviors. So what was, what was once normal became deviant and even stigmatized in a short period of time. Now people were forced to adjust to what has repeatedly been referred to as the new normal. The global pandemic swiftly and dramatically changed our boundaries between normal and deviant. Now we'll come back to deviant to know what that really means. So it's about the, between normal and deviant, safe and risky, and in some cases what's law-abiding or not. Now the first cases of novel corona coronavirus were reported by Health Canada somewhere in the neighborhood of January, January 25th, 2020. By the middle of March, travel restrictions were in place and travelers entering Canada were required to go into quarantine for 14 days. Now, people who exhibited symptoms of COVID-19 were encouraged to get tested and were asked to self-isolate until they felt better. So, what does this all have to do with criminology? Well, in part, it reminds us that social norms, routines, for that matter, crime and deviance are dynamic. They're not static. They don't stay the same. They can and do change. Now, usually change is much slower than what has happened during the pandemic. Also draws attention to those groups who's, who resist the dominant or mainstream definition of the situations those who question whether the pandemic is even real or construction of governments um, and big businesses who want to control the populace. In addition, not all demographic groups, we can include women and minorities, for example, were, were or are even treated um, or experienced the same things. We all have a slightly different experience. Some industries were and are treated differently. The healthcare field, they worked all through this. Teachers struggled around whether to work or not work. It was a real difficult challenge. Now this chapter explores various historical perspectives on crime and criminal behavior to help us understand the basis and the purpose of our current Canadian criminal justice system. So criminology is an interdisciplinary science in which systematic study is used to explore the nature, the extent, perhaps the cause and control of criminal behavior. Now it's also important to note that the definition includes a few key characteristics that's good to hold on to. One, it's interdisciplinary science. This just means that there's many different disciplines working together to understand crime and deviance, and I'll refer to this throughout the course. The second, and also equally important, is that it's a scientific study. So it avoids our subjective points of view. And it emphasizes objectiveness, unbiased reporting, and evidence-based. 
Okay, so let's start looking into our past and an historical view of criminology. Now we'll begin with the Middle Ages, and I'm going to remind you, because it's going to sound odd, during these times, although some of what they did were unusual or even unbelievable, it is through their eyes and during these times, the Middle Ages, that are best to understand their perspective rather than for us to judge the inappropriateness of what they were doing. I mean, certainly now, if they were here now, they wouldn't be doing what they did then. You see? So we're going to begin with what's known as classical criminology perspective. Now this grew out of a reaction against the barbaric system of law, punishment, and justice that existed before the French Revolution of 1789. So until that time, there was no real system of criminal justice in Europe, just crimes against the state or crimes against the church and crown. Now, often judges would exercise much discretion to convict a person for an act, not even against the law. The monarchs of the time often would, would issue what they called in French, lettre de cache. And really what they were saying here, under which the individual could be imprisoned for almost anything. Disobedience to one's father, for example, if that were the case, I would have been imprisoned for life back then. <laughs> then, of course, there were the witch craze from the 14th to about the 17th century, where anywhere from 40,000 to 100,000 witches were either tortured, burned, or drowned. Now, by the mid 18th century, Caesar Beccaria, now he was one of the first to really do a, com a comprehensive design for an enlightenment, enlightened um, sort of criminal justice system that would serve all people, not just the monarchy. Now, he and his follow followers laid the foundation for classical criminology theory. The tenets or characteristics would include individuals as having the free will to choose either criminal or conventional behaviors for reasons of greed or personal need. Two, it posits that the punishment should be proportional to the crime. And three, assumes that the more certain and swift and severe the punishment, the better society will be at controlling criminal activity. You could think of punishment fits the crime as being capturing Caesar's perspective. Now, in, into the 19th century, the scientific method was starting to influence sciences. So positive, positivist criminology was a branch of social science that uses the scientific method to consider human behavior as a complex product of social, biological, psychological and economic forces. And we'll see those same elements throughout the course. Augusta Comte, he suggested that societies will pass through stages. The primitive people believe that inanimate, inanimate objects have life. The sun is a god. And later, people rallied behind the rationale and the scientific view and this is the perspective of the positives. Now there's two main elements to this view. They see all human behavior as a function of external forces that are often beyond the individual's control. Now think of these things as the outside forces could include wealth that you have or don't have, your earning power, politics, government, war, famine, personal factors like other people. We're not always in control. We often react. The second part was reliance on the scientific method. Um, things accepted must be scientific and evidence-based. That became very, very critical. Now, we'll, we're just going to review a couple of branches of this positivist crimin uh, criminology. There's early positivist, 
ism and biological determinism. In the early positivism, they had included such scientific studies as the facial structures, what your face and bumps, those could all influence or be predicting of criminal behavior, the shape of the facial features, your eyes, your nose. And it was in the early 19th century, excuse me, it was in the early 19th century that the connection between biological factors and criminology was paired. Our first consideration of the biological medical responsibility of criminology. And so that leads us to the second sort of branch, if you will, and that's the biological determinism, which had considered this biological foundation to criminology. Another Caesar, Caesar Lombardo, he posited that criminals are a lower form of life. He argued that criminals were born criminal and they had inherited traits and physical features. They suffered from what he called atavistic anomalies. And this included things like if a person had a much more peaked nose, much like a bird of prey, predator, or a sloped forehead and a large jaw, strong canine teeth, such as a carnivore, and general hairiness of the body. Now, phrenology is related to the facial features, but phrenology was an add-on. This study was of the bumps on our heads and the shape of our skulls was also very popular in this period of time in determining criminology, or criminality, it's more accurate. So, where the biological determinism was you know, considered the biological factors, sociological criminology focuses on the relationship between various social factors and crime. Um, Quillet and, and Gary use social statistics to show what, if any, influence social factors may have on crime. Now, it was Emil Durkheim. He's an important sociologist researcher but he saw crime as a result of social forces rather than what's rooted in the individual. Durkheim saw that crime as an inevitable and is necessary for a healthy society. It's an odd thing to be saying, don't you think? He pointed out that societies don't only have crime, they also have sanctions. This way, creating the boundaries between good and bad. Sanctions would be like what happens when you break a law. You get sanctioned. You might go to jail or you get a ticket. Sanctions inform society as to what is good and what is bad. And it promotes social solidarity. The more people know what's good and what's bad, they can coalesce behind the good and it provides that social solidarity. Now, Durkheim, he also coined another term called anomie. Now, anomi is a sensation. It's as people move from the rural areas and the farm life, and they moved into the cities where jobs were, so they could get work and potentially have a better life. One of the results of this shift into the city is this isolation among lots of people, this disconnect that occurred between people, and the uncertainty. It's this disconnect with society that can partially explain the presence of crime. In around the same time of Durkheim, the Chicago sc school group, who specifically studied the relationship between the environmental conditions, you know, that we'll get into more clarity about environmental conditions, but the environmental conditions and crime. They considered neighborhoods, that's an environmental condition, poverty levels, and the things like that could promote criminal activity. The socialization view, this is another sort of generalized view. It views, it considers that the relationship and the interaction that we have with others, they look at the family life, peer groups, and education, and other such influences. Because that's what socialization is. It's our relationship with our family, friends, school, and how they help us learn who we are and what we should be um, valuing in our society that we live in. 
Socialization is a process where we experience, as we grow up, we learn from our family, basically what is desirable and undi undesirable, how to behave, and, how many, uh, and many other survival skills. Socializ socialization can also include our peer group, school, family, all can influence what we learn as children, adolescents, and fully into our adulthood. Socialization is lifelong, child, adolescent, adulthood, old age. Now finally, we can touch base just briefly also on Karl Marx. Marx influential in the development of conflict criminology. It views the human behavior as shaped by economic and political forces and sees crime as a function of class conflict. The class conflict is the relationship between the owners and the means of production, he called them the capitalist or the bourgeoisie, and the people who do the work or sell their labor as the proletariat or the working class. Now he looked at the consequences of this inequity that exists between those who own and those who work for and the exploitation of workers. And that was the premise of a lot of his work was that, that relationship. Now more contemporary criminology, well the perspectives are described as evolution of previously held viewpoints on criminal behavior. Like for example, classical theory evolved into what is now known as the more na modern rational choice theory. And we'll get into that later, not in this particular chapter, which argues that criminals are making rational decisions when they commit crimes. Now, similarly, um, Laborosorian theory, that was that Caesar Lombaroso, has evolved into contemporary biosocial and psychological perspectives. The original Chicago School vision has been updated into a social structure theory which maintains that disadvantaged economic class position is the primary cause of crime. Well, I know that's been kind of quick, but we're just doing an overview. Now, this is why it's so important to have your textbook. So please make sure you have one so you can follow along with the videos and find out what kind of content you might want to do a little further work on. Now, this is going to end part one. Now, in part two, we're going to look at what criminologists do what statistics do they use? How are they defining crime? And lastly, at some of the, um, of the research and some of the results of what crime and criminal law is currently. So that's where we're getting started. All right, I hope you're getting yourself ready. Make sure you look at your syllabus, print it off and have that calendar marked up with what you need to know when things are due. That's a good way to start your first week. All right, everybody, we'll see you in part two. Bye now.